All righty. Take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to the book of Job. Job. Some scholars say, some people that's a lot smarter than me, that's for sure, says this is the oldest book in your Bible as far as being written down, okay? It's not going past Genesis, so to speak. But as far as being recorded, this is the oldest book in the Bible. Job, and let's go to chapter number 19, if we could. Chapter number 19, the book of Job. It's good to have all of you here. I promise you that. Well, you're thankful for your presence being here. There's some people here that I was their pastor. Oh, Lord. We ain't going to say how many years. But it's uh, good to have them with us. Good to have my family, most of my family, some of my family uh, with us. Nieces, nephews, grandkids. Lord, how, how, who am I leaving out? Oh, my wife's here. <laughs> but it's good to be here. I hope you'll be blessed by being here. Job chapter 19. I want to read the 25th, 26th, and 27th verses, please. Resurrection Day, that's what we're celebrating, by the way. And as I mentioned in my prayer a while ago, I think it's the most important day of the year for Christians, for Christians. Some people said, no, Chris, Christmas. No, I'm going to disagree with you a whole heart. I know he was born on Christmas Day, but if that's all happened, there ain't much hope for me and you. You know, he died, but thank God he didn't stay in the grave. So because he lives, we can live. And here Job, uh, Job was, uh, the Bible says in the first chapter of the book of Job that he was the mightiest man, the richest man, probably what we would have said, the most influential man that lived at that time in the east. And the east uh, over there around Jerusalem in that area. And he had 10 kids, seven boys, three girls. And he had, oh my, bukus of uh, sheep, camels, etc., etc. He's a very, very rich man. Had it made, so to speak. But there came a time <coughs> When Satan showed up where God is, and God asked Satan, he said, have you considered my servant Job? God was bragging on him, in essence. And Satan said, oh yeah. But he said, you, you know, you sort of build a hedge around him. Take, take what he's got and see then what kind of man he is. Well, God permitted Satan to do that that a servant came to Job and said, all the sheep, all the camels, all everything's gone. We've lost it all. Well, didn't change Job that much. So Satan come back again. Said, I tell you what, let me touch him, touch his body, his health. Let's see what happens. And God said, okay, go ahead. But you can't take his life. So Job became sick, full of balls all over him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very painful sickness. And he, his wife even said to him, go ahead and curse God and die. Well, that's the best friend Job had was his wife. Should have been, anyhow. My best friend is my wife. And uh, been that way for many, many years. But Job said, no, you came into this world naked. We're going to leave here naked. <laughs> and he had three friends. Now, that's what the whole book of Job's about. These three friends come to see him. One of them's name is Elihizar, if I pronounce it right. Another his name is Zophar, Zophar, 
and a nun's name, Bildad. And the 19th chapter, he's talking back to Bildad because Bildad in the 18th chapter, this is the second time Bildad's come to him now and talked with him and Job is answering him. So when you get down to the 25th verse, Job says to Bildad, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh mm, shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Amen. A man has lost everything he's got, family-wise, everything else. And uh, by all reasons, he has lost his health. Now, you can afford to lose your money or something like that, whatever, house, cars, whatever. You can afford to lose that. And it will affect you. I know that. But you still got your health. Thank God. You can get some more money or cars or houses. The Lord allowed you to live long enough. But here, there's no hope for Job. I mean, he looks around, he must say, my word. But he didn't say my word. He, he, he said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. I hope I can have that mentality, honestly, to say when my health starts to crumble, your health's not crumbling, preacher, not right this moment, but I'm not a young man anymore. I realize that there's some things I can't do. I always, I try it sometimes and fall flat on my face. But I want to talk to you about the resurrection, which Job's talking about. Now this is a, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus will ever come into the world. You're not going to find the word resurrection in the whole Old Testament. It's not there. I looked for it. And it's not there. So, Job hadn't been taught the resurrection by some preacher, etc. But Job knew something that we all need to know. You notice, when I started to read that first verse, he said, for I know that my Redeemer, it was personal with him. Job didn't have a religion. He had a relationship with God, Jehovah, the great I am. And he said, my redeemer liveth. Hey, if you don't have a redeemer, you liable to be like Bill, Dad, and the rest of them. Think there is no resurrection. You liable to be like the Sadducees in the New Testament that says there is no resurrection. You can come across people nowadays in our world, our educated and all kind of, uh, yeah, stuff we know and learn every day, but you allowed to come across somebody in our world. Said, oh, when you, when you die, you're just gonna be like an old dog or a cat or an animal you see laying on the road that car got or something. Yeah, they, they know, there's nothing after death. Well, Job knew different because he called him my redeemer. He didn't say your redeemer. He didn't say to build that our redeemer. Amen. Amen. He said my redeemer. Redeemer. It is personal, folks. You have to have that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ or you don't have a redeemer. You can be a member of the church. You can be baptized. You can do good deeds. You can give money. There's a lot of things you can do, but you can't fill the spot of having a redeemer. One, I looked up that word in the Greek, 
in the Hebrew. It's an interesting word, redeemer. It means to go to the slave market. Back in those days, they had slaves. It means to go to the slave market and see a slave and buy that slave. Jesus Christ went to the slave market one day, one night, and found somebody called Carlton Allen. And he bought me right about where I'm standing, somewhere right in this area. He bought me. But he did more than that. That word redeemer not only means that you bought the slave, but you take him by the hand and say, come go home with me. I own you now. Y'all not getting it. You should have been here Friday night and seen Sister Johnson and listened to Sister Johnson. We've been in a revival this week, by the way, in case you're visiting with us. My soul, my soul. said, come go with me. And it means not only to buy him, but it means to take him by the hand and said, come go home with me. And then on the way home, he turns loose of the slave's hand and says, you're free. You're no longer a slave. Take off. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm glad salvation, redemption, doesn't bring slavehood. Amen. It brings freedom. Amen. I'm glad that we as Christians have a liberty that nobody else on this earth has. I'm free. Amen. Amen. I've been redeemed by the Redeemer. My Redeemer. I don't know if I can say our Redeemer because I don't know about all of you, but I can say my Redeemer lives. And Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. And because he lives, <laughs> Job had the assurance, I'm going to live. Amen. Amen. Folks, if there's anything I'd love for you to comprehend today, get a hold of, I know, I don't know all of you personally, but I know most of you personally. But let me say to you, please, please, before that death angel comes, and he's coming. And he's gaining on you every day. Uh, you're born to die. Amen. It's a point of the man wants to die. The Bible said, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And after death, the judgment. So there's nobody in here not going to die unless Jesus comes. Now, if Jesus comes while I'm trying to preach this message, hey, you're welcome to take over. Because I'm a leaving. Amen. I'm going to be caught up in the air with him and ever more to be with him. But <laughs> until then, hey, I'm going to keep on preaching, okay? Everybody wants to know, Brother Allen, when are you going to retire? That is an ugly word. <laughs> Don't even mention that to me. Amen. I enjoy what I do. I wouldn't be doing this for a living. Amen. That's not the purpose of ministry. But I'm going to get off on another message. Let, leave me alone. Go ahead. <laughs> he said, my redeemer. <laughs> Our redeemer. He could have said, but he didn't think Bildad was in the same spiritual shape he was in. I imagine you could have turned the wheel around and let Bildad, all his kids died in the same day. Can you imagine having 10 funerals in one day? I got 10 wonderful grandchildren. Some of them are here today. I can't imagine. And I, I, all 10 of my grandchildren at one time? Uh-uh, no thank you. But he had buried all 10 of his children, seven boys, three girls at one time. They all died the same day. Go back and read the first and second chapter. I believe it's all in the first chapter, if I remember correctly. And it'll tell you that. That they all died in one day. 
I imagine a lot of people, and I might be one of them, would have had sour grapes in their mouth. Lord, you gave me those kids. Now, why did you take them? Lord, you took all of them. I don't have any children now. I don't have anybody to take my place, to spend all of my riches, etc. If it had turned it around, I imagine Bill Dad would have thought and said some mighty strange words to God. Amen. Ten kids gone, all his treasures gone, everything's gone, and even now his wife <laughs> started off, just go ahead and curse God and die. Here comes Bill Dad, here comes Eli Zophar and Elihizar. Here they come with the same message. Job, you've done something wrong. You need to repent. Job, you, 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 this wouldn't happen to you like this if you hadn't done something wrong. And they kept on. You can read the whole book of Job. That's what it's all about. How they accused him and accused him and accused him of not doing the right. And you're suffering for your wrongdoing. I agree you can suffer for your sins. I don't say you can't. But I'm telling you, he hadn't sinned. Not one iota. Could I tell you the end of the story so you won't have to read the whole book of Job? In the last chapter of the book of Job, it said God restored him twofold. Instead of 10 children, 20. Instead of, I forget how many camels and all that he had, thousands. He's had more thousands. Because Job said, my Redeemer. He knew God in a real way. Amen. May I say to you, from my little bit of experience, it's a whole heap easier to live in this world if you know God. I can't explain to you why things go on all the time like they do, but I know God's in control. Amen. I know the final say-so is not with Mr. Trump, it's not with the Supreme Court, and it's not with the popular vote, et cetera, et cetera. The final decision we made by God and himself Amen. of what happens to me and you and what happens to our country and our world. God's in control. If I didn't believe that, I think you'd have to bury me tomorrow because I wouldn't see any reason whatsoever for living any longer. But knowing that my Redeemer, my God, is in control and God has never been surprised by nothing. You don't surprise somebody that knows everything. Amen. Amen. And he knows everything. And he's in control of everything. You say, well, why do people suffer? I have found this in my life. I don't know about your life. But it's a time when you suffer and, and you don't understand what's going on. It's a time you move a little closer to God. Amen. Some of our children are here. And I can well remember <laughs> them being little bitty things. I wish they were still there in, in and you know, it's, it's no fun, an empty house, empty nest, whatever you want to call it. I know sometimes you want to pinch their heads off. Amen. <laughs> but, but it's no fun not having the shoes in the floor and you got to walk. Come put those shoes up, Jed. <laughs> Jody. Your dirty clothes, you left them in the bathroom when you took a bath. And I could go on and on. And they're as guilty as they can be. But there'll come a day you wish there was dirty clothes. Wish there was shoes, et cetera, et cetera. Because it's no fun. Then you have to learn how to live one with another you and her. And that's another ball game. I ain't a going there. 
But that's another ball game. <laughs> then you hear her hollering, Colin, get your shoes up out of this living room. Get them dirty clothes in there. Put them in the dirty clothes bag. You know where to put them. It's just a continuous thing, right? <laughs> Job knew his Redeemer. He said, my Redeemer liveth. Amen. Jesus referred to his resurrection more than once, but I picked out three that he referred to. You remember, you probably heard it, probably studied it. When Jesus went into the temple, that great, big, beautiful, wonderful, it took 46 years to build this temple and it was full of gold and everything else. And he went in there and they had donkeys in there. They had sheep in there. They had all kind of stuff in there selling and trading. And he took and made him a little whip, a little whip. <laughs> That's what I'm calling it. And he drove them out of there, out of the temple and cleansed the temple. He said, my father's house is a house of prayer. It's not a place to sell or buy. And he drove them out of there. And the bunch of Jews, Pharisees, come to him and say, well, show us a sign. That's all Jews want. I mean, you read your Bible, you're going to find that. The Jews wanted a sign about everything. And Jesus said, okay, and said to himself, okay, okay, you destroy this temple. He was talking about himself. The Bible says that. He said, destroy this day, this here temple, and said, in three days, I'll raise her up. Amen. They didn't get it. They said, it took 46 years to build this temple. And in three days, you're going to rebuild it? They didn't get it. Nicodemus didn't get it when Jesus told him, you must be born again. He said, must I go back into my mother's womb and come forth again? And everything, you can't apply. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> you can't get the meaning of the Bible looking at it physically. Amen. You've got to look at it spiritually, friend. But anyhow, Jesus referred to his resurrection. That's what he's talking about. You destroy this. They did destroy it. They put him on a cross. He did die there. They did bury him in a barred tomb. And he did stay there three days and three nights. But after three days and three nights, he come out of that tomb. Amen. Another time, he used this illustration. He said, as Jonah, y'all remember Jonah? <laughs> Jonah. He said, as Jonah was in the belly of the big fish or the whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Three days, three nights. Talking about his resurrection. When Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus, died, and he was a good friend of Jesus's, he died. And as Jesus waited two days longer, and then came toward Mary and Martha's house, and word got to Martha and Mary, said, the master cometh. And Martha ran out to meet him and said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother, Lazarus, wouldn't have died. And Jesus, trying to comfort her, said, I am the resurrection. He is the resurrection. Amen. There's nobody going to get you out of that grave except Jesus Christ. Amen. And one day, the trumpet shall sound. And the Bible said the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then the Bible said we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, snatched up to meet them in the air and to evermore be with the Lord. Resurrection time. I am the resurrection, he says. I'll close with this. 
in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, there were some people that did not believe in the resurrection. There were some people challenging the Apostle Paul on the matter of the resurrection. And he said this, if there be no resurrection, then my preaching is vain. May I say to you right now, if there be no resurrection, I've got no good news for you. I can promise you nothing. I can promise you, you're going to be buried, if not in that cemetery out there, in one somewhere. And after you're buried, as Job said, if you go back and read the text I read to you, the worms is going to eat your body. That's all I can tell you. I've got my preaching. If you don't put the resurrection in preaching, you got nothing to say. Amen. I can't promise you good health. I can't promise you wisdom. I can't promise you nothing. Our preaching is in vain. That's what he said. You're just blowing hot air. if there be no resurrection. And he went farther. He said, if there be no resurrection, then I'm a false witness. If there be no resurrection, I'm telling you stuff that isn't true. Amen. If there be no resurrection, <laughs> whatever I say, you're going to say liar, liar, liar. And you would be right if there be no resurrection. If there be no resurrection, he went on to say, your faith no good. It ain't gonna benefit you one bit to have faith. Or say you have faith because there's no hope after death if there be no resurrection. Hmm. That's not a pretty picture. Hey, <laughs> you leave that young alone. He's fine. If I can't out holler a young and I'll quit preaching. <laughs> if there be no resurrection, your preaching's in vain. You're a false witness. Your faith is empty. You got nothing to put your faith in. What you, let me say this. What you put your faith in if there be no resurrection? Well, I'm going to be a Baptist. God help you. That's all I'm going to say. I found some of them Baptists in jail. In penitentiaries. Yes, I did. They probably still some there. Not that I was in there, except to tell them the truth. <laughs> but if there be no resurrection, the preaching's in vain. Mm. Your false witness. Your faith is in vain. If there be no resurrection, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 18, your loved ones that you've buried has perished. There's no hope for them. Now I've studied this Bible for a few years, okay? I've never been to the cemetery. Seminary, excuse me. <laughs> but, oh Lord, I get myself in trouble. I have studied that Bible for a few years. And I thank God for it, that I've had time to do that, that my wife put up with me and let me do that, etc. But one thing I know that the Bible teaches wholeheartedly that I know some people that's already in heaven. Yes, I do. The first person I ever baptized was my mammy, my mother. 
And she wouldn't get in the baptistry. Uh-uh. We go into the Lapahal River, son. I said, I don't care where we go, Ma. I just, you got to be baptized. You got saved, now you need to be baptized. And I went to the river and baptized Mama. I saw something, Jody, in studying this thing. In 1 Thessalonians, the 4th chapter, the 13th through the 18th verses, he talks about the coming of the Lord and how the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, watch now what the Bible says, shall be caught up together. On the way up, Brother J.R., I'm going to see Mama. Amen. I'm going to see Daddy. Amen. I'm going to see my little brother, my little sister, my older sister. And if God doesn't come pretty soon, I might be the one you see going up. I'm glad there's hope, if I might use that word, but hope in your Bible doesn't <laughs> use it like we use it in the English language. Hope is more of an assurance word, that it is right. Amen. But I have that living hope. The Bible talks about a living hope. And I believe, <laughs> yeah, Juju, we're going to see Minnie Pearl. <laughs> Juju's mama was our pianist for years. And we had a good time at that church. And somebody bought her mini pearl hat. I remember that. She wore it and played that piano. Amen. And we're going to meet mini pearl on the way up. Amen. Loved ones and friends and et cetera. We're going to meet them. But the last thing he says in 1 Corinthians 15, I want you to see. The last thing he says about this resurrection is in the 19th verse. And he said, in this life only, you have hope, faith. In this life only, while you live here, ever how many years you live, in this life only, you have hope. And you don't have any hope after this life? He said, you're the most miserable of men. I believe I've met some of those people. Just miserable. Doesn't matter. They got good health. Doesn't matter. They got money. Doesn't matter. They got this and that and the other. They're just miserable. Because they don't have hope. Hope. A lively hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. I brought you now as far as I can bring you on the resurrection. Now my question is, are you going? Are you going up? Or are you going down? The Bible teaches heaven's up. The Bible teaches that a place called hell is down. And in the resurrection, when that resurrection comes, you're either going up are you going down? I, for a few years now, I've been trying to get people to go up with me, not down. And I'll do anything within my power to help you to go up. I will, not knowingly, not intentionally, would I do anything to cause you to want to go down. That's not a good place to go at all. Resurrection day. The Lord willing, we'll celebrate it again next year. But it could be that the resurrection comes before Easter next year. And if it does, hey, I want to meet you up there. I don't want you down here. I want you up there with me and the rest of the children of God. I love every one of you in this building, my family, and I appreciate your efforts to be here for this day. 
But I don't want this day to overshadow what God says. I'm just a human being. There's a gospel song. I used to know who wrote it, but I can't bring it to my mind. It was a young lady who wrote it. Just an old poor sinner saved by grace. You're looking at him. I had nothing to offer God whatsoever. The night I came down this aisle with that boy back there, he's a man now, Jed in my arms. I had nothing to offer him. A wasted life. Nothing to offer. And he accepted me just like I was. See, a lot of people don't get saved because you think you got to straighten your life out. That's not true. You cannot straighten your life out. Only God can do that. And I beg of you this morning, don't miss the trip. The trip home. Amen. Let's stand to our feet, bow our heads. We're going to have an invitation time. If I can pray with you, I'd consider that an honor. If I could tell you more, I'd consider that an honor. Don't leave here <laughs> headed the wrong way, please. Please. 